I've gotten such great feedback from life group leaders about the prayers and the discussions that you guys have been having around this whole topic of lighting our world. I just can't get over the fact that I feel like God is doing something. And he's starting to fill up the front three rows. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's doing something. Look, the Sylvesters came a little closer than the Perez's. <laughs> I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for the way God is moving in our hearts and in our minds. Um, I'm just excited about some of the stories that I've heard about these lights that are going on, about people that are turning their lives over to Christ. We got one that's out there that our staff has been praying for for I don't know how long. I mean, we've been praying and praying and praying and praying for this lost person, this one particular lost person to come to Christ. And in a miracle story, that person finally gave in to the Holy Spirit this past week and gave their lives to Jesus. Yeah, God is doing something, and I just can't get over it. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot more about that. I I'm proud of you guys uh, for the response that you've shown to the Sharing Your Faith Conversations class. Um, the Gideons that are providing that for us are blown away by this, by you. Because um, when I first talked to them, I said, we probably need two classes. And they're like, really? You need two? Nobody ever asks for two. Um, I mean, you'll be lucky to halfway fill one. I was like, nope, our church is going to respond. We, we need two. But now we got four that are mostly full, four classes that are mostly full. And that's because God's doing something. That's because he's working your heart to be on mission with him. And it's really an amazing thing. In fact, I got a surprise for you. Um, as typically happens, we've had a couple of spots open up for today's class. We had a couple of people that had to kind of back out. I think we got two or three spots there. And so there's room in today's class if you would like to jump in. And the way you do that is you just use your phone to scan this QR code right here and it will take you to the registration. If you can't make it tonight but you still haven't signed up yet and you can't do tonight, there's don't worry, you can get on the wait list for one of the other classes. Uh, but there's the code right there and get you. we wanted to get you straight to that registration uh, take it tonight um, there's going to be dinner so it's good it's at 5 p.m. tonight it's a little long it's 5 to 8 but there's a 30 minute break in the middle for dinner and um, you know it's better than the evangelism training courses I went through back in the day they were like 60 weeks long they were ridiculous long so uh, this will be really really good it's not memorizing an outline it's learning how to listen and to nudge conversations towards Christ that's what that's all about so I'm really really pumped about that and I can't wait I'll be attending the class tonight so God is starting something. He's doing something amazing, and I can't believe it. So we, we see it happening, yet we continue to wait. You know, we continue to wait. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and when everything is ready, I'll come back and get you so that you will be with me where I am. You know, he said he'd go and prepare a place and we're still waiting for that day where he comes back to get us. I mean, as great as this place is, as beautiful as this place is, there's a better place. And he's coming to get us, and he's coming to take us there. So we wait, and we wait, and we wait. And meanwhile, while we wait, look at what's happening to the world around us. We definitely see hope bursting out. But you know what's going on in the world. What's, what's most of the news stories? It's awful, right? It seems like the world is falling apart all around us. Fentanyl deaths in America have been at a never unprecedented high lately. We have kids, young kids girls and boys with gender confusion they don't understand the uniqueness of the way God made them we see such violence and hate in the world around us we got spy balloons and exploding trains right I mean we got all kinds of crazy bad stuff going on 
It feels like our culture is falling apart and all kinds of world crises going on and it feels like nobody's at the wheel. I mean, if you, if you look around, it can feel pretty hopeless, can't it? The pain and the anguish and the suffering that's happening all around us, why do we have to keep waiting? I bumped into a friend of mine the other day that I hadn't seen in quite some time and it was jarring I I had to look closely because I I wasn't even sure if it was him I, I almost didn't recognize him because the disease is just ravaging him his Parkinson's has got him to where he's shaking like this it's changing his appearance even and he's going in tomorrow for an unrelated brain surgery because of what he's going through and it's it's, he's terrified about it all. And I got a chance to just talk to him and pray for him. He loves Jesus and he trusts God's plan. And he talked to me about that day where Jesus is going to take him home. Yet we keep waiting and waiting and waiting. My question today, it's the first blank on the page, is this. Why is this taking so long? Jesus, you said you were going to go prepare a place and that you'd come back and get us and take us to the better place. But yet we keep waiting and waiting. Why is this taking so long? Especially when there's so much pain and suffering. My goodness, it's good to see Paul back this morning, right down here in the front section. Man, it's so good to see you back. You've been suffering for a long time after your surgery. How are you feeling? I see you got your arm immobilized, shoulder immobilized, better? Looking good. Yeah, man, we've, we've lifted you up in prayer, and it's just good to have you and your big smiling face back. Just love, love to have you back. Well, we love, we love you being here. But I know it feels like it's been a long time, hadn't it? It does to me. I can't imagine what it feels like to you. Just waiting and waiting for this relief, for God to do the miracle, you know, for, for him to take us all to the better place. It's taken so dang long. This whole idea of waiting is old. It's not new. It's not 21st century. It's not even 1st century. It goes back way before that. In fact, you find David crying out to God years and years and years before Jesus. Psalm 13, he says, How long, O Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Can you relate to that? Doesn't it feel a lot of times like the enemy has the upper hand when you look at your family situation, when you look at the world around you, when you watch the news? It feels like the enemy has the upper hand. How long, oh Lord? How long? How long for the innocent murdered in the womb? How long for the countless victims of sex trafficking? How long for men and women trapped in depression and anxiety? Just driving through Atlanta, how long for the homeless all around us? How long, Lord? And the thing that we have to come to grips with, it's the next blank on your page, is that God's timing isn't my timing right? God's timing isn't my timing. I always say that God's plan is better than my plan, but I'll be honest, I don't understand God's plan. I trust him, but I don't understand his plan. Peter, the fisherman turned preacher, had some insight on this for us. And he writes about it in 2 Peter 3. He says this. He says, don't forget this one thing, dear friends. He says, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. To him, a thousand years is like a day. I mean, think about it. Jesus was here two days ago. Right? To him, he was here on Friday. 
right? It's no, no time ago, Friday. If you have a middle school boy, he probably hasn't showered in that amount of time. <laughs> Three or four more days to go, right? Every week, whether he needs it or not, right? I mean, just think about it. Time is different for him than it is for us. And so he gives us this insight. Peter gives us some insight onto not just that this is, but why this is. Why in the world do we keep waiting? Peter is really clear. Look what he says next. He says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. You think it's taking so long. Why so long? He's not just sitting up there taking his time. He's not bored. He's not doing something else. He's not looking the other way. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to what? To what? Repent. To repent. He knows. He knows that the day of the Lord is coming. And for us, it's a good day. For us, it's the day that we get to go be with him forever, but it's not a good day for everyone. He knows that judgment is coming for the sinner, right? He knows that eternal pain and torment is coming from the sinner. And so he's not just delaying. He's not just up there in heaven forgetting about us. Jesus has a game plan here, and he's playing the long game game he is patiently waiting because why because if people are going to repent then how can they know to repent unless somebody calls them to repent how can they know about their sin which puts them in jeopardy and God's great love for them and the grace of Jesus Christ unless somebody tells them. Somebody has got to call them to repentance. Maybe, maybe we're not the ones waiting. Maybe he's the one that's waiting on us. Maybe we are the holdup, not him. He's being patient because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. To be destroyed. In Romans 2, Paul says something similar. He says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? He's giving time for the sinner to repent. He is gracious and patient, giving chance after chance. Hadn't he been gracious and patient with you? I mean, how many times can I count? God, I'm sorry for my sin. I, I, I know you're right and I'm wrong. I, I won't do that anymore. And before I know it, I'm saying the same thing about the same sin again. God, I'm sorry for my sin. I, you're right. I'm wrong. I don't want to do that anymore. And it's the same thing over and over. And his patience, his grace to me and to you is overwhelming. And he's extending that same patience and grace to the unrepentant sinner. That's the good news. That's the good news that we get to tell people about, that everyone you have ever met and everyone you ever will meet is lovingly designed in the beautiful image of God. But yet everyone you've ever met and everyone you ever will meet is broken because of sin you know, everybody is a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all broken. That beautiful image has been really messed up and hard to see because of our sin. And that sin puts us in jeopardy because there is judgment day coming where all sin will be punished. We have no hope on our own. But God was able to somehow see past that. 
and he chose to love us so much that he sent his only son to come here and to live a perfect life with no sin, no separation from God. So he goes to the cross, and on the cross, God lays all of my sin, all of your sin onto Jesus, and he pays the price for my sin and your sin. He's already paid for it. It's already dealt with and done. Amen? He died in my place, and he went to the grave, and cold and dead there for three days. He stayed there, dead in that grave. But then on Sunday morning, he rose again. He he rose again, and today he lives in each and every one of us that are followers of him, and he brings transformation. He brings redemption and he brings something valuable out of what seems worthless. Am I right? And because of that, we don't want to be the reason he's waiting. We don't want to be the thing that holds up his plan. The world may seem to be falling apart, but Romans 8, 28 says this. We love this verse, that God causes everything, everything, to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. I I say we love this verse. I feel like we love the first part of this verse, right? We know God causes everything to work together for the good for, for us. And he does, but look at the qualifiers. There's two of them right here. He works everything together for the good of those who, number one, love God. Love God. Jesus says the great commandment, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? I mean, this is, this is who he's talking about, people who are part of the great commandment. In fact, he says you love God and you love others. You, they go together. They're locked together. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Can't have one without the other. So God works everything out for good for those who are loving God, and then number two, who are called according to what? According to whose purpose? His purpose. So people who love God and people who are working his long game plan, who understand what he's called us to, the big, great process of redemption that he's doing to redeem this world to himself and as long as we are called to his purpose and we're loving him then God works it all out for the good I trust his plan I I trust his plan his plan's better than my plan I don't always understand his plan because the plan does involve pain in this life am I right it does involve suffering in this life but God's playing the long game And we're praying that he works his purpose through us this year. We're praying that God works his purpose of bringing people to him this year. And we're praying for 150 new Christians through our efforts this year because of what he does in and through us. That's what we're praying for. We're praying the prayer of Moses from Psalm 90. Let us, your servants, see you work again and let our children see your glory And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. In other words, next blank, God's long game is redemption. His long game is redemption. That's what he's doing. That's his purpose through us in this world. He will bring value out of what now seems worthless. It just may not happen on my timetable. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to obey him. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to be used by him however he wants to use me. I'm, I'm going to wear my bracelet wherever I go. I'm going to be ready and listening to the Holy Spirit nudge and have me tell people about Jesus. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I'm ready to give a defense for what I believe, ready to tell anyone that will listen about Christ. Jesus says in John 15, he says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. True disciples bear fruit, right? True disciples bear what? Fruit. Okay, I'm just going to check. I'm just going to check. What does this mean? I'm just going to check. What type of fruit does a banana tree produce? 
Good, very good. What type of tree does a, an apple tree produce? Okay, good. So what type of fruit should a disciple produce? Disciples, right? Of course. If you bear much fruit, then you truly are my disciples. Disciples bear fruit. We want to love him, and we want to live our lives called according to his purpose, bearing fruit. And look at this promise that he gives us about this. He says in the same passage in John 15, he says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Are you, are you happy? Because I'm going to be honest with you. Happiness comes and goes in this life. Right, because your circumstances change and happiness is kind of bound to circumstances. So the marriage is good, happy, but then the marriage is bad, not happy. Right? The health is good, happy, but then the health is not good, not happy. Right? <laughs> Lunch is great today, but dinner stunk, <laughs> not happy. Right? Your team wins the Super Bowl, your team loses the Super Bowl. Your team wins the election, your team loses the election. Right? Happiness comes and goes with circumstances, and he doesn't promise us happiness. He says, I'm telling you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. My joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And when he gives us his joy as we are his true disciples, then our joy will overflow because of his joy. Dude, that's even better than him showing us his approval. Am I right? When he fills me with his joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, we have this treasure. We have this treasure, this good news, this abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' life in my life, this treasure in jars of clay. I'm but a jar of clay holding this incredible treasure to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We have his power living in us. Shouldn't it just be exploding out of us into this dark, dying, sad, inflicted with pain world? Shouldn't it just be exploding all out of us? Shouldn't we be working this long game for the win? Right, Romans 10 says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? How can they even hear unless someone tells them? This is what we're talking about this year is that someone's got to tell them. Someone's got to be the one to actually be bold enough in the Holy Spirit to open their mouths and be used by God to just tell them the truth about how much God loves them We've been scared. We've been keeping our tails tucked between our legs. But, dude, God is doing something, right? We see God starting to do something all around us, and I just want to catch his wave. So somebody's got to tell him. Someone's got to be the light in this dark. Next blank on your page is this. Somebody say something. Someone say something. Someone say something. What would that look like for you? I've asked my good friend Justin Chadwick to come here and come on up here Justin and just tell us tell us what that's looked like in your life if you don't mind somebody say something you know Steve's talking a lot about God's working and, and things that God is doing but I want to tell you a little bit about what God has done and it's somebody say something keep that blank on there please somebody say something you know, we, uh, it's a kind of a long story, but I'm going to truncate it because the story is not the point. But we went through something that's all too typical nowadays. Uh, our son, who's now 28 years old with two grandkids, leading a wonderful life, had knee surgery in his teens and was prescribed oxy. And that pain relief turned into addiction. And that addiction turned into really big problems that our family had and really dark times. We were confused. We were angry. We felt guilty. We felt it was our fault. We were scared. 
We were scared for his life. We were scared for his family. We were scared for so many things. And we prayed to God. And God worked a way in our lives, which is I, I, I think is kind of unique. Well, not, not unique biblically, but I think unique nowadays if you're not looking for it. But if you're looking for it, you'll see it. You see, we were searching for answers, and we went to one place. It was a little uh, prayer place down in Dalton. And we got to meet a little lady that was gifted with the gift of prophecy. And she prayed over my wife. And she told him, I know you're scared. I know you lie in bed crying yourself to sleep every night. I am there with you. This problem is too big for you to handle. You are much too small for this. Take this burden off of your shoulders and put it on mine. I have him. He's in the rinse cycle. And when he falls, I'm going to put the people in place to help him stand again. And the prodigal son will return home. And when he returns home, he returns home for good. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, that's Jeremiah stuff. Um, and that's what happened. God worked in us. And God worked in us because people obeyed God. We didn't have a church home at the time. We were looking, and uh, my wife went with Andrew because we didn't trust him going to anywhere on his own to get his driver's license renewed. And when she was in, and when they were in there, he had to pull out his old license. And when he opened up his wallet, the lady working at the stand saw his chip in his wallet. She goes, "Oh, you have to come to our church." We're with the Orchard Church, and we have an awesome Celebrate Recovery program, and you need to come out, and you need to see us. My wife told me the story afterwards, and she says, I want to go to that church. It seemed everywhere else. We, we went to one other church here in, in LJ, and we were there for over a year, and I don't think we knew a single person that we didn't know before we started going there after we were there for a year. We were desperate for a church home. We were desperate for something to fill us. And she opened her mouth. She saw that chip. She saw the initiative. She heard God's urging to say something. Say something. And that's why we're here today. And this church played an integral role in Andrew's recovery. Because this church allowed us to find what I truly believe is the one place in this world that would help Andrew. He entered into a one-year recovery program. You know how many times we talked to him before about entering a 60-day, 90-day? Wouldn't do it. He entered into a one-year recovery program where they promised me that we are not going to cure his addiction. We can't promise that, but we will let him know about Jesus. And he will know all about Jesus. And if Jesus... And if he has Jesus in him, the addiction will leave. And that's exactly what happened. We owe our son's life to this church. We owe our son's life to somebody speaking out and saying something. You never know where that person is in their path with God. God tells us he is after every single person out there. We are all imagers of God, and he wants all of us. As Steve said, he's waiting for that to happen. You don't know where that person's at. If God urges you to say something, say it. You never know what kind of an impact it will have, and you may never know, and you don't need to know. Just know that God's plan is the right plan, and if he's asking you to do something, be obedient to it. Thank you very much. I love this church. The thing that I find super powerful about that is you said if Jesus is in him the addiction will leave I love that I love that um, thank you Justin thank you very much for sharing so somebody say something I know we don't always know what to say so we've given you a tool this morning right on your chair did you get these did you get the little bracelet and the card um, so the card is is basically Annie made these for us Annie Oakley here on our in our staff um, this is basically a little quick short biblical explanation of the gospel 
and it's all right here, and you'll see it's color-coded, and the colors correspond to the bracelet. So when you learn how to explain the progression that's on the cards, it's really easy to just show somebody with the bracelet on your wrist. You know, it's just really easy to describe to them how you are lovingly designed in God's image. You are an image bearer of God, but the problem of sin means that your image is broken, like all of ours. And unfortunately, that sin leads to death for all of us. We all have that day coming when all sinners will pay. But the blood of Christ covers our sin because he loved us so much. He covers our sin and he makes us clean. And that leads us to the opportunity to get forgiveness uh, when we repent and turn our lives over to him. And that change of life brings life, abundant life here and eternal life there. So you can see it's just really easy to walk through that and explain. We wanted you to have this opportunity. I've been wearing my bracelet now since the beginning of the year. And here's the funny thing I didn't expect. I, I wear it everywhere I go, and zero people have asked me about the bracelet so far. Zero. I wear it in the gym with all the people there. And I don't know if they're just like, oh, that's, that's a Christian thing. Don't make eye contact. <laughs> don't ask about the bracelet. I, I don't know. I, I wear it to the, to the store or I talk to people all the time. I, I wear it everywhere I go and no one asks me about it. And, and the goal isn't for people to ask you about it. They probably won't. The goal is for it to be a tool for you to be a reminder that it's our job to say something and to help you know what to say next. And you see the little presentation I just gave? It didn't take an hour and a half it just took a couple of minutes. It didn't even take a couple of minutes. It probably took about a minute. And then we wanted you to have this card, not just so that you could know what these verses that are imprinted are, but also so you could give that card away. And we got a whole bunch more that will be given you. In fact, we'll be giving these out starting tonight at the conversations class so that you can be using these in your conversations. I just wanted you to have that because somebody's got to say something. So Peter tells us, same Peter, fisherman turned pre preacher. He says, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. It seems like it's taking so long. It seems like we just keep waiting but when we share, when we are on his mission, when we're living our lives called according to the purpose that he's given us, then he gives us his joy. He gives us his joy so that we can live this life, so that we can deal with the difficult circumstances that this life has to bring. It's not just about happiness. It's not just about sadness. It's not about just joy. Um, it's not just about uh, being on top of everything and being on the bottom. It's about the joy that he gives that lets us see through and past it all. Peter says, since everything around us is going to be destroyed, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God. And look at this, hurrying it along. The more we look forward, the more we're on mission for him, maybe the less we'll have to wait and we'll actually hurry that day along. You know, they say time flies when you're having fun. If the joy of the Lord comes through making disciples, then I can see what he means by hurrying it along, that it will come before you know it, and our joy will be made complete. It feels like we've waited for a long, long time, but last blank on your page, it won't be much longer now. It won't be much longer now. Obey him, trust him, be used by him, and it won't be much longer now. Oh, Lord, let us, your servants, see you work again. Let our children see your glory, and may the Lord our God show us his approval, and yes, make our efforts successful. God, that's our prayer. We just want to be used by you. We see that maybe you're starting something. Lord, we want to be part of it. Lord, use us how you 